So you may be familiar with a study that came out of University of Michigan in 2019, where they showed that endogenous DMT is at the same level of other neurotransmitters, and it can be synthesized in the brain during a death experience. So they induced cardiac arrest in the rats. And during that time of dying with the lack of oxygen and all of that, there was a huge surge of DMT in the brain. And so we were able to see in these dying rats that the validation for when people say I have a near death experience, and it sounds a lot like if you take DMT, we had some validation that yeah, it's happening in the dying experience, which is something that Rick Straussman in his book, The Spirit Molecule, he hypothesized that way back when he didn't have the research, but University of Michigan in 2019 gave us that research which is great. I love it, right? So when you have an NDE, you have a little bit more validation that, yeah, you probably were experiencing your own psychedelic, you know, that was your own psychedelic sense. But Mm -hmm. that isn't really relatable to the average person. We're not trying to induce death on a daily basis, right? So it's like, okay, great. It's like when I die, I'm going to have a great experience. Wonderful. But what about me in my regular life? What the heck is this thing doing in my body, right? And there has been a lot of speculation by Stephen Barker, the one that was in the video that I saw, Rick Straussman, that DMT is actually part of our ability to perceive the friggin' world on a daily basis, right? It modulates our perception, right? So why wouldn't we want to know about this? Like if it's part of how we perceive, right? All the time, not just a mystical reality, but it's been detected in our retina, for instance. So when we experience the world, depending on the level of DMT in our body, are we experiencing a different world than the person sitting next to us, right? So anyway, this dissertation that was never published that I ended up getting from 1982 really brought the discussion into a really more relatable way. You know, it gives us the basis for a lot more potential for real research into this being the ability DMT modulating our perception because these rats were, yes, they ended up being killed at the end of the research, but the DMT wasn't showing up because of their death. The DMT was showing up because they were put in different stressful situations. And listen to this, like I couldn't help but thinking about the pandemic when I was reading this research, because what they did with these rats to induce stress was they didn't torture them physically. Guess all they did? They put them alone in a friggin' cage, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. what were oh, we all God. doing? We were yeah. in friggin' isolation, right? People went a little bit bonkers, right? And so what they showed is, I mean, we're social beings, right? Like, part of our ability to cope with life is being around other people, you know? And it was almost like a grand experiment in how to make people loop <laughs> right? Making them stay in their own houses. Because in this research, yes, there was two conditions. One is they used restraint with the mice. So they had this kind of cloth type of adhesive thing that the animal couldn't move for eight hours or 18 hours, different time intervals, and that induced stress. But from what I remember from reading the research, the condition that produced even more stress was putting them in a housing unit without their buddies, right? So when they were in group housing, no DMT showed up. But as Stephen Barker has said, what we have to realize is it's not like we don't have any DMT if we're not stressed out. Back in 1982, they didn't have very precise measurements. They were measuring nanograms. We can actually measure picograms now. We can measure much finer amounts of these endogenous substances. And the idea being that during normal life, these endogenous psychedelics can still be modulating our perception, right? Sub-psychedelic levels do have power. That's why, for instance, there's a pharmaceutical company right now that's using sub-psychedelic levels of DMT to help grow brain cells, neurogenesis, in people that have had stroke using DMT. And they're giving sub-psychedelic levels. They're not making these people trip out, but with the sub-psychedelic levels, it can actually grow brain cells. So us thinking that, okay, if it's not a 
full on psychoactive amount that it really has no purpose. Yes, it does. I mean, if it can grow if brain cells, it can do a lot of other things, including influence, you know, modulate our perception, right? So that's what they found in this study that was never brought to the world, that the adrenal glands actually showed much more endogenous DMT than the brain. Now, we already know from the 2019 study that the brain can synthesize its own DMT, right? But can it also come from other parts of the body and travel to the brain? Sure it can, because DMT is a small enough molecule. It can pass the blood-brain barrier.